we have Cameron Lloyd joining us. Hello. Hello. Hi, Karen. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. So you were joining us from uh, University of Tennessee, or well, not from it, I guess you're at home, but that's where you're currently um, affiliated. And yeah, you have your full 20 minute slot unused to deliver okay. your wonderful talk, What Microbes Live Below Our Feet. All right, cool. So I'm going to just get out of the way and uh, let you begin, but we'll just make sure, yeah, screen sharing is all okay. Okay. That's a nice busy desktop. Good. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> we, we go in each other's homes and see each other's desktops now, which is yeah. what we do. So, um, so I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about the microbes that live beneath our feet. Um, and this is a picture that I took while studying deep subsurface microbes in Argentina. Um, when you think about life on Earth, you can't just stop at what we can see on the surface. Um, my colleagues have added up the total estimates for the amount of microbes that live in the mud that's buried underneath the oceans all over the Earth. And it turns out that there's more, micro, li more living microbial cells there than there are estimated stars in the universe. So this is actually a huge ecosystem and we know very little about it relative to the other ecosystems. Um, more recently, folks have added up the total number of microbes that are present under our feet on land. And this number actually increased the total number by quite a bit. It more than doubled it because there's potentially even more microbes that are living underneath the continental surface than there are under the oceans. So um, what this adds up to is how do we do this? How do we study this vast biosphere under our feet? Well, I like to think about the earth like this. Um, when you take all the water away, the oceans look pretty fascinating. And it sort of emphasizes how um, uh, the subsurface, thinking about the subsurface, you can see all these um, interesting, cool features on the seafloor. Um, and this map, uh, one reason, I also like this map for historical reasons because it was published in 1977, which is a long time ago. And it's not that far off from the much better estimates that we have today. And all of this data was put together by individual um, seismic uh, data that came back from many, many cruises all over the world by this woman, Marie Tharp, who studiously put all the data together. And she's the first person to actually figure out that there were seams running through the seafloor. Um, so I sort of went through recently and put dots on every place that, that I could figure out had really good microbial characterizations of the deep subsurface at some, at some depth. And um, it's not too, too bad, except that if you imagine um, that you're trying to talk about this entire ecosystem from just these dots, suddenly you, you really miss a lot of complexity. Like if we were all in an alien spaceship trying to describe the subsurface and this is all, or trying to describe the surface of Earth, and these are all the, the dots that we had, we would never be able to come up with the whole picture um, that would be accurate. So what we need to do is we need to just keep going forth and studying this massive, mysterious deep subsurface. And the normal way that microbiologists, such as myself, study things are that, you know, we grow things, we put them on petri dishes, but there's a couple of problems with this. And the biggest problem with just approaching things through culture is that now that we can get DNA sequences from life in lots of different places, um, we have discovered that if you look at the total tree of life, so this is, um, you can imagine this like a family tree. So sticks that are closer together would be more like siblings and then farther apart or more distantly related items. Every single major branch that has a red dot on it is something that no one has ever grown in culture. And what this means is that as you look, this is just the archaea, but the bacteria look pretty similar. Um, most of what's out there, most of the um, deep branches on the tree of life have never grown in culture by anybody ever. And so that means that for now, we're kind of stuck with just looking at their genes and trying to infer what they're doing from their genes. But another reason why we can't depend on cultures is that how something acts when it's on a Petri dish touched by our gloved hands is probably gonna be a little different than how it acts actually out in nature when it's doing its own natural thing. Um, so for these reasons, um, my lab and the way I approach things is often to just try to figure out as much as I can about a microbial subsurface ecosystem without messing with it. <laughs> so I try to disturb it as little as possible and just gather all the information sort of passively that I can about it. Um, so today I want to tell you about some really cool recent work that we've been doing in Svalbard, which if you've never heard of this amazing place in the Arctic, 
Um, this is, I just took this off of Google Maps, but this is uh, the archipelago called Spitsbergen. Svalbard is the name of the biggest island of that um, archipelago. And it is very, very far north of the northernmost part of Norway. It's pretty much co-equal with the upper tip of Greenland. So this is very, very high latitudes. It's about 79 degrees north. Um, it takes a long time to get there. Um, and this is the work that I'll be showing you was mostly done by um, two of my students, Joy Bongiorno, who's now a professor at um, Maryville College, and Katie Sipes, who is still working with me. Um, and this was largely funded by the Simons Foundation, although we uh, got much needed help also from the French and German research station in Svalbard, Avi Pev, and um, the NSF, the National Science Foundation in the US, and the Center for Dark Energy Biosphere Investigations. So what they did was they went up to Svalbard and they sampled um, marine sediments in these fjords. So these, this is a close up of just one of the fjords of Svalbard. And you can see all the glaciers are sort of emptying in to this fjord and they um, went out on a small boat, dropped cores off the back of it and took some samples and brought them back up. And from this, um, Joy was able to put together a vast diverse ecosystem of largely organisms that are eating and or breathing iron and sulfur compounds. So despite the fact that there's all these um, uh, strange organisms in Arctic sediments that uh, we don't necessarily know so much about, um, it turns out that many of them, uh, we can actually infer their physiology um, to be uh, using iron and sulfur compounds. And um, it's not, so it's not simply that uh, they're there sort of dormant and waiting in the subsurface, they are actively um, doing lots of things with iron and sulfur and they're, they're pretty active microbes. Um, and the reason why we think we saw so many iron and sulfur cycling microbes is that if you, anytime you fly over Svalbard, you know, to get around to your field stations, in front of the glaciers are these massive, um, just, pushes of iron. You can see this red stuff coming out of the glaciers. Um, so this is really specific um, to Svalbard because it happens to be hosted by a lot of iron rich rocks and um, there's uh, red Devonian sandstones uh, that are getting um, dredged over and glacial, glacially dredged um, and spewing into the fjords. And so our hypothesis is that this is what's feeding the microbes. So you can kind of see it as a subsurface glacial fed ecosystem where the microbes are eating the iron and the sulfur that's getting pushed off by the um by the glaciers themselves and this is just another picture i took from a um from a plane where you can actually see um all this iron streaming off the edge of an iceberg um so the icebergs sort of float this stuff out into the middle of the fjords um but this this work really um was just kind of a presence absence thing um the really big challenge is to figure out how to study the actual activity of microbes as they're out in nature. You know, if we have a pure culture, we can say, we can watch it make um, a certain chemical or we can watch it eat another chemical and we can say, yep, it is making methane or it is eating iron. Um, but it's hard to do that when you just collect a mud sample from the subsurface in the Arctic as we did. Um, so one thing you can do to study the activity of microbes out in nature is that you can look for not just the DNA, you can look for the RNA, which gives you a measure of how active those genes are, how much they are turned on into messenger RNA to eventually get turned into proteins. Um, so here's an example that is not from the subsurface. This is sort of the opposite of that. This is uh, Bordetella pertussis, which is uh, the bacterium that causes whooping cough. This is its genome stretched out end to end. So um, each little gene has its own little um, dot here. Um, and the y-axis tells you whether that particular gene was upregulated or downregulated. And this is cool. I mean, this technology, which is often called RNA-seq technology, if you're working with cultures, um, can tell you so much about the physiological state of an organism. You can say, oh yep, this gene region, those are getting turned on this gene region, those are getting turned off. And you get this really high resolution um, data about, about the activity of, of your cultures. Well, we wanted to do that, not with cultures, but with Arctic mud. And as far as we know, um, people have done this in a couple of other environmental samples, but 
nobody had done this with Arctic mud. Um, we were gonna have to pick apart the signals from the RNA coming from one organism versus another organism. And we just kind of crossed our fingers and made the measurements and hoped that we could see something as, as pretty as you can see with whooping cough. Um, so what does such a transcriptional genomic map look like if you make it on a natural Arctic microbe that's living in the wild? Well, the first thing we did was we wanted to get the, the actual genome to, to stretch out like that and, and look at the transcripts. And we happened to catch um, one that, um, these are not photographs, uh, micro photographs taken from my lab. These are from um, other, another group, but this is a uncultured group called the Woziales. Um, it's within the gamma proteobacteria, but it is not, it does not have a close relative in pure culture. So it is one of these microbes that is kind of mysterious to us. And one reason why we find it so interesting is that it tends to be the dominant microbe in sort of the upper layers of marine sediments. So we kind of have this feeling like it must be doing something important. We just kind of can't quite figure out what it is. Um, we know from work that, that other teams have done that this is, um, it probably can fix carbon. So it's probably an autotroph on some level. Um, and this, this group made lovely pictures of it where the RNA is in green and it's DNA, it's wrapped around a DNA core that you can see in blue. Um, and it has these interesting morphologies. So we were lucky enough and we caught one of these um, genomes. We got a pretty complete and we said, okay, now, when we extract all our RNA from this environment and we make that pretty map like we did a whooping cough, remember that one that had lots of genes upregulated and downregulated, what's this going to look like? It didn't look like that at all. <laughs> it blew our minds. We did not expect to see this at all. Look at these genes. If you line up all the genes across the genome, certainly some of them are going up and down. We kind of, if we zoomed in on this, it would look like the whooping cough genome. But look at this gene. That is one gene and it went crazy. There's tons and tons of transcripts of just this one gene. And it didn't matter whether we went to one station in one fjord or a different station in that fjord, or if we went to a different fjord entirely, like drove a boat around and took a, a sample from another place. It didn't matter where we went or what depth we looked at. We got huge quantities of just this one gene. Um, this, this pretty much, you know, this is one reason, this is my plug for doing exploratory science. I never would have written the hypothesis, hey, is there only one gene that gets highly transcribed in this organism? I wouldn't have enough information to even ask that hypothesis, but here we have it. So I can't tell you exactly what's going on with this. It's still somewhat of a mystery to us, but one possibility is that this gene looks a lot like this gene, which is present in this cultured organism called Stigmatella orantiaca. And um, this group put uh, gold particles so that you could see them on where this gene is getting expressed into proteins. And six hours after this organism starts turning into a spore, so a spore is a dormant phase. It's a very highly specialized dormant type of microbe. Um, and only certain types of microbes are capable of making spores. Um, it starts to form these different types, or this, just this one protein and expressing lots and lots of this protein. And then a full day after it starts making spores, this protein uh, sort of clusters up on itself. Um, so that's our best hypothesis right now is that maybe this uncultured Arctic microbe is actually turning into spores as they're buried in the Arctic sediments. And this would make sense um, because if it's dependent on oxygen or if it works great with oxygen, then as it sort of gets buried under marine sediments, it can harden down and become dormant and then maybe wait until, you know, an iceberg dredges across the bottom of the fjord and pushes it back up to the surface again where it can become a vegetative cell again. But that's just a hypothesis. Now we have a hypothesis. Um, so we will definitely be doing more work to see if it's actually doing this out in nature. Um, so to, to finish up, which I guess I blew through that very quick. I was overly worried about being too long. So uh, I always end up going too short when I do those things. Maybe people will have questions. Um, there really are many, many mysteries uh, yet to solve about the organisms living in Earth's crust. Um, I find this fascinating. It doesn't matter where we go or what questions we ask, something cool is going to be down there. Um, and now um, sort of as, as uh, microbiology and molecular biology has regressed, we really have the molecular tools to do the same sort of high level molecular work that we can do on, on cultures 
but we can do it actually out in the wild on natural samples and start piecing together what these things are actually doing out in nature. So I will stop my screen share and we can either have... Thank you. Yeah, no, I have a couple of questions if I'm visible again. I am, cool, yeah. Um, so yeah, you're looking at microbes that are living in the crust. Yeah. Um, but how deep down can we find these microbes? Yeah. Any the deepest that anybody is on record of finding a microbe right now is about five kilometers. Okay. And is that Which purely because maybe... you can't drill much further without it costing too much? Yeah. And it's, it's also, we think that there's going to be an ultimate limit because there's a geothermal gradient. Um, mm. As you go deeper and deeper in the Earth's crust, it gets hotter and hotter. Um, currently, the known upper temperature limit for life is 122 degrees Celsius, which that usually hits somewhere between um, the surface, if you're at a really hot spot, um, and it can dive down to maybe 20 kilometers, would maybe mm -hmm. be the deepest, uh, maybe a little deeper. Um, or that may not be the upper temperature limit, limit for life. Because, I mean, if we, but even with that kind of thickness, if we think about a sphere and the depth, that's a huge amount of space that you can find microbes. So even if they're not beyond 20 kilometers, I mean, are we looking at most of the microbes being deeper than the surface? If you yeah. just look at them, yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you, put, if you like picked the height of the center of mass of microbial life on Earth, it would not be at our feet. It would be slightly below it. Yeah, okay. So they're beneath us more than around us. I mean, they are everywhere. But I mean, you know, there's been a lot of hype in recent media about finding phosphine in Venus. Mm -hmm. um, and here you have, you know, you'd have to have microbes living at high temperatures, perhaps high pressures. So are the microbes that live in the mantle or the crust perhaps places to look for kind of life that perhaps would be similar? I don't know. But they yeah. would be fairly extreme to be living deep and hot and under high pressure. Yeah, absolutely. These make awesome analogs for life on Venus or any other planetary body. And there's a cool thing about high temperature and high pressure. High pressure has a tendency to make lipids more ordered and high temperature causes them to be disordered. So they can kind of work against each other and you might be able to get them down deeper at both high pressure and high temperature, which is kind of cool. Okay, so it kind of feels more normal for the bacterium. They some, love some, Yeah, They okay. want their extremophiles. It's true. They, they think we're extremophiles, I guess, living yeah. in weirdly cold environments or there's just nowhere near enough acid. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your talk and yeah, sure. joining us on International Microorganism Day all the way from, from Tennessee and representing yeah, the US in this mass international live stream of talks. Well, I'm glad you guys are doing this. This is pretty darn cool. Yeah, well, so we're recording everything. So hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we'll get them all on YouTube. So all the videos will be watchable because you know there's been so many. I mean, it is impossible to have watched them all just because of the time constraints and the time zones. So hopefully we can all then watch the ones which uh, take our fancy if they weren't there when we were awake. Maybe, maybe you'll discover that somebody was been staying awake on five hour energy and coffee and did all 24 hours. Yeah, I mean, that's our freelancer, Ben. He's basically been doing that. And uh, apart from three hours of sleep, I've kind of been doing that as well. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a long one, but it's been great fun. <laughs> well, thanks for joining and submitting your contribution. And um, yeah, well, hopefully people can see you again on YouTube. But thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Bye.